Thank you, everybody, for coming. My name is Bob Bixby. I'm the executive director of the Concord Coalition. It's, it's great to have everybody for our annual Economic Patriots Dinner. This, your presence tonight proves that there are at least some people in Washington and St. Louis who are concerned about fiscal responsibility. So that at least is something. So give you. <clears throat> um, so I, I, I think we have a very, uh, very ambitious program this evening. And uh, the Concord Coalition has always emphasized policy analysis, public education, and field uh, operations for public education. And so we want to uh, recognize our first order of business tonight is to recognize a volunteer of the year. But in order to do that, I am going to introduce our national field director, Phil Smith. Uh, Phil has been with the Concord Coalition. <laughs> Almost as long as I have 200, uh, 200 years, or whatever. No, 20 years, uh, 20 years something, and uh, yeah. So Phil had hair when we hired him, so. Okay, our national field director, Phil Smith. Thank you, Bob. I've been around so long, I need glasses now. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Before I present the Volunteer of the Year Award tonight, I'd like to recognize some of the folks in the room who've traveled here from all around the country, uh, and they make a big difference in our field activities, and particularly within the past year. Uh, we call them our fiscal lookouts. Uh, we have five of our fiscal lookouts here tonight in the room. So if you'll stand, please, when I call your name. Gail Gerties. Naval Lieutenant Commander Alexander Madden, Kevin Wiley, Jeff Harper, and Eric Carter. Thank you. The fiscal lookouts are modern day Paul Revere's, but instead of fighting the red coats, they're fighting the red ink. They're citizen leaders sounding the alarm and educating our fellow Americans through civic engagement, speeches, media appearances, and facilitating exercises such as our role-playing federal budget simulation called Principles and Priorities. Uh, and speaking of that exercise, that's one of our favorite things we do. We work with uh, members of Congress around the country to do this, uh, both Democrats and Republicans. Uh, we have a staffer in the room tonight, John Halpern, who works for Sanford Bishop. Uh, uh, John, thank you for being with us. We, uh, thank you. <laughs> Congressman Bishop hosted us uh, down in Columbus, Georgia, at Fort Benning at the National Infantry Museum where we ran this. It was a wonderful backdrop for this. Uh, but we don't just have staffers in the room tonight. We actually have a real live member of Congress. Uh, Congressman Ted Budd of North Carolina hosted this event in Greensboro. <laughs> Ted. We had a packed house at the Greensboro Public Library, standing room only, and it was a fantastic event. Uh, so thank you, Congressman, for doing that. So now, as promised, it's time to present the Tom Rogers Volunteer of the Year Award. Uh, this award is named for our late colleague from Raleigh, North Carolina, who served in a number of roles at the Concord Coalition, from local volunteer to state director to regional director. Tom Rogers really epitomized what it means to be a leader, and a citizen educator. I'm proud to announce tonight that this year's Tom Rogers Volunteer of the Year Award goes to, drum roll please, <laughs> from Indiana, Mr. Kevin Wiley. Kevin, please come on down. Come on down, Kevin. While Kevin's coming down, let me brag on him just a little bit. Kevin first became interested uh, in and supportive of the Concord Coalition uh, back in the mid-1990s. Come on down, Kevin. We have a, an award for you right here. Stand on my left. We'll get a picture in just a second. So um, he first came to us in the mid-90s, and he, he noticed that there were financial leaders and luminaries like former Commerce Secretary Pete Peterson, Fed Chair Paul Volcker, uh, were so involved with our issues and our organizations, that's what first attracted to him. But Kevin in particular, has always told me about how Pete Peterson's notable book from 2004 really energized him. Uh, the book is very familiar to us at Concord. Uh, it's titled Running on Empty, How the Democratic and Republican Parties Are Bankrupting Our Future and What Americans Can Do About It. Mr. Peterson wrote in this book 
about the importance of joining organizations like the Concord Coalition. And in the closing, Mr. Peterson says to younger generations, educate yourself and educate your parents about the world you have inherited and work together to rebuild a society based on thrift, stewardship, and justice between generations. Kevin has taken those words and put them into action. Kevin has worked with the Indiana Congressional Delegation to host our budget exercises countless times at town hall events. He speaks to Rotary Clubs, near and far, and other civic groups. He goes to college campuses, and most recently, he's developed a long-term partnership between Concord and the Bowen Center for Public Affairs at Ball State University. Additionally, Kevin is a natural spokesperson for fiscal responsible policy, and he's been interviewed multiple times by print, radio, and television. Simply put, when it comes to volunteer field work for the Concord Coalition, Kevin can do just about anything, and he does. Now, after uh, this award was announced, Kevin received a congratulatory note from former U.S. Senator Dan Coates of Indiana. He wrote, as you know, I spent a lot of my time during the last term in the Senate working on the issue of our national debt. Unfortunately, the problem continues to grow. In my current role as Director of National Intelligence, I remain concerned that our increasingly fractious political process, particularly with respect to federal spending, is threatening our ability to properly defend our nation, both in the short term and especially in the long term. The situation is unsustainable and represents a dire threat to our economic and national security. Like Director Coates, Kevin understands the seriousness of this threat, and he's doing something about it. Kevin, thank you for being a fiscal lookout. Thank you for all of your work for the Concord Coalition. Thanks to your wife, Janet, for loaning you out to us so often. And congratulations for winning the Tom Rogers Volunteer of the Year Award. Thank you, Phil. <clears throat> Thank you, Kevin. 26 years ago, Paul Songus, Warren Rudman, and Pete Peterson announced the founding of the Concord Coalition. This, is, uh, this, this year's dinner marks a sad occasion for us because it's the first time that we've had one of our economic patriot dinners without any of the three founders present, uh, owing to Pete Peterson's passing earlier this year. But if it's a sad occasion, it's also a good time to rededicate ourselves to the principles that, uh, that those three patriotic Americans articulated back in, in 1992. When they announced the Concord Coalition, they did not engage in partisan rhetoric. They didn't offer a lot of free lunch solutions. What they did tell us was that, they, that we had to be reminded of some basic economic truths that we had to be concerned about generational responsibility. And they reminded us of the power of citizen activists to preserve the American dream, I think power and uh, duty. Now, um, their wisdom, their words guided our actions uh, ever since. Uh, certainly through the deficits of the early 90s and through the surpluses of the late 90s. You, you remember when people were worried about paying off the debt too fast? <laughs> that happened. But then again, they were back into the deficits again, and frankly, some very big deficits uh, in, in, in recent years. I've been with the Concord Coalition since the very beginning, and uh, this would be a great time to give you a long speech about Warren Rudman and Pete Peterson and Paul Songus and what they meant to all of us and still do, but uh, you'll be spared that because rather than my having to go through all that, uh, we can let them speak for themselves. So I give you now Paul Songus, Warren Rudman, and Pete Peterson. Today in New York, former Democratic presidential candidate Paul Songus, joined by retiring Republican Senator Warren Rudman, announced the formation of the Concord Coalition. 
a grassroots organization that will be dedicated to solving the problem of the nation's growing budget deficit. Good morning. I think the clock behind us tells the story. What it talks about is a generation that is not being responsible to its young. And today we are forming the Concord Coalition to take back the future of this country so that our children and their children can live the kind of life that I think Americans deserve. Yesterday I was at the Concord Bridge in Concord, Massachusetts and thought about all those people who many, many years ago decided this country was worth fighting for and were prepared to give up their lives. What we are here to talk about today is the same kind of dedication to the future. And we believe that the Concord Coalition will be a powerful grassroots organization that will say to the politicians all across this country that the American people are ready for truth, ready to take back the economic future of this country and have a profound sense of sacred obligation to their children. A lot of the old bromides that have been stated for the last several years by both parties are not appropriate. So today there's a new approach, a new coalition, a new grassroots organization that will say to our children, we recognize the threat that you were under, and today we seek to change that direction. Pete Peterson, I've asked to uh, speak. Pete has been the, I guess, the organizer in a de facto sense of this, and have asked him to talk about the investment and productivity issues inherent in our economic situation today. Pete? We heard a lot about supply side not too many years ago. Supply side was supposed to have meant more investment capital. But all we've done is to turn into a demand side economy in which we're essentially running amok. So when I look at that deck clock, what I see, Paul, is a debt cancer that is metastasizing throughout our entire economy and our society. And if we don't revise and stop that clock from going soon, we're going to uh, reduce our ability to innovate, to compete, and to uh, improve the living standards of ourselves and our children. So this businessman believes that it's time that we restate some very elementarily yet powerful truths about capitalism. Number one, savings is the building block of investment. Number two, investment is the foundation of productivity grains. Number three, increased productivity means uh, increased growth. And number four, economic growth is the engine of prosperity that allows our society to advance. Yet here in America, this is the country that wrote the books on these trucks, on these truths. We've either forgotten them, or worse yet, we have stood them on their head. Now, the biggest reason I'm involved in this and am privileged to work for these two great Americans is very personal. I am a child of immigrants. My parents, both of them, came to America through Ellis Island. And they worked very hard, and they saved a lot, and they educated their children. As a result, my family and I are the beneficiaries, like many other families are, of the American dream. So I am here today because I want to work with these great Americans to help restore this American dream where the possibility of education and opportunity and upward mobility is there for all and not for a privileged few. I want my children and my grandchildren's generation to be able to both dream and realize that dream. And the reason we're here is because we believe it's time for the citizens of this country to have another voice. What we expect to do is to go across this country, organizing groups of the Concord Coalition, individual citizens, into a vast network of American citizens who have one special interest, the interest of economic growth and a future for the kids of this country. We do not believe that the current system can do that. We believe it's time for the American citizens to do that, that there are many special interest groups in this country, but there is one overwhelming special interest group. Those are the people who work for a living today, who care about their future, and don't want to see the American dream slip through their hands. To that cause, we dedicate ourselves. Thank you very much. If I could make one final comment, we are not a think tank. We are a grassroots organization. 
an educational organization that seeks to change the winds politically in this country by educating people to the economic threat and giving them an alternative path. We are not a think tank because enough thinking has already been done. The problem is not that the solutions are not known. The solutions are known. The problem is there has not been the political will to implement those solutions. What we want to do is to bring forth the American people what the real issues are, to make them understand that there is no such thing as a free lunch, and we all have to pitch in together if we're going to make America strong again. So there are many things that we can look at for economic plans. And we will, in the coming weeks, be announcing a distinguished group of Americans, as Paul said, representing all walks of life, and then we will go forward across this country. Uh, join us and look forward to this thing becoming a major force in American politics. Thank you. Hey, hey, Pete. Paul, let's make it work. <laughs> Uh, one of the distinguished Americans that the Concord Coalition has been uh, happy to be affiliated with over the years is Senator Jack Danforth. Back in 1994-95, they chaired a commission that uh, accurately diagnosed these problems. Frankly, the findings of that commission uh, stand up today, which uh, means it was quite prescient, but uh, it also means that we haven't gotten it done in terms of policy solutions to, to address these. So before uh, presenting our Economic Patriot Award, I'm going to introduce Senator Jack Danforth, former senator from Missouri. Thank you, Bob. In 1994, Bob Carey and I co-chaired a commission on entitlement reform. The commission agreed that Social Security and Medicare weren't sustainable as they were. It produced beautiful charts in four colors to make the case. Nothing happened. Entitlements, principally Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, now account for 61% of federal spending and are largely responsible for our national debt. In 1994, the national debt was $4.7 trillion. We thought that that was alarming. This year, it is $21.8 trillion. In 10 years, it will be $34 trillion. Why is nothing done? The answer is politics. Social Security and Medicare are the third rail. Touch them and you're dead. Soon after I left the Senate, Pete Peterson, the patron saint of the Concord Coalition and I, made a presentation in Kansas City. The audience was elderly. Pete had with him our beautiful charts in four colors. Together, we made an absolutely take-out dynamite presentation. The audience of elderly people responded with head-shaking disbelief. We had a question and answer period and the Put it mildly, it didn't go well. <laughs> the question was, the basic question was, what do you mean cut Social Security? Why not cut waste, fraud, and abuse? Cut that, not us. And after 15 minutes of being beaten up by these older people, Pete turned to me and said, you take over, Jack, I'm going to the airport. <laughs> <laughs> A similar audience faces every candidate for federal office in every campaign. From every candidate, the answer is a pledge. I will not touch Social Security and Medicare. And the list of entitlements grows. Yesterday, 
It was prescription drug benefits. Tomorrow it may be free college education and Medicare for all. More money from the government is a political winner. The one hope for sanity is to appeal to the reason and patriotism of the American people based on irrefutable economic facts. Enter the Concord Coalition. No organization better tends the flickering flame of fiscal responsibility. The Paul Songus Economic Patriot Award honors its recipient for outstanding work in focusing attention on the fiscal crisis. No one is more deserving of the award than Jeff Fox. He is working with the coalition to sponsor research on the development of an economic growth agenda that is fiscally responsible. This is not the sort of research that will sit on a shelf. It will be the basis for a roadshow of policy forums conducted by the coalition beginning next year. The goal is to bring fiscal policy from obscurity, where it now resides, into the bright light of public attention. I hope you will indulge me in a personal word about Jeff Fox. We are from the same hometown, and I am enormously proud to present this award to him. In St. Louis, the Fox family is synonymous with good works, which they do with generosity and remarkable energy. Jeff is CEO of Harbor Group, a very successful and demanding business. Among his many communities endeavors, he has just finished his work as co-chair of the United Way campaign in St. Louis. If you want a challenge, try to find free time in Jeff's schedule. That he has committed his resources, talent, and energy to the cause of the Concord Coalition makes him especially deserving of our recognition. It is my honor to present the 2018 Paul E. Sangus Economic Patriot Award to my friend, Jeff Fox. Wow. It's, uh, thank you, Senator Danforth. It's uh, an hour, honor to be on the stage with you. You are a man that our country and our state in particular has been so lucky to have. The difference that you've made in our world and our country is just incredible. And so thank you for all that you've done through your whole life works to make this a better place. I'd also like to thank all my family and friends who flew up from St. Louis to, to join me and make this event all the more meaningful, especially my wife Lota and my daughter Elizabeth. And thank you to the Concord Coalition, particularly for this remarkable award. I am so deeply honored to receive it. For someone like me who has spent his life primarily out of the public eye, to be given a, an honor like this is hard to believe. To follow in the footsteps of Pete Peterson, your father, Alan Greenspan, John McCain, Alice Rivlin, and many, many more is surreal for me. When Senator Danforth and Bob Bixby called to tell me about the Patriot Award, I was shocked. 
I thought, what have I done to deserve such a prestigious award and to be in the company of such accomplished past recipients? Actually, I'm still trying to figure that out. <laughs> to the best of my understanding, though, this award is due to a project I'm working on with the Concord Coalition, a project that began for me when I became very concerned about the level of debt our politicians were putting on our nation. As a businessman, I knew that just like a company, a nation can only handle so much debt. I began to realize that in the political system we have, a politician gets rewarded, re-elected, by giving something to the constituents, even if for short-term gain the future is destroyed. As I watched our debt grow, I knew that it's not a matter of if, but a matter of when our future would collapse under this burden. So at that point, I began working on trying to get individuals elected who I thought this problem and th their work, would wor they would work to overcome it. But as we all know, for many years now, the problem has only been getting worse. Both political parties have shown us that the only thing that they really know how to do, <clears throat> excuse me, is to add to the problem, add to the debt. It's hard to make the tough decisions and get reelected. And as we know, one of the definitions of insanity is to keep doing the same thing and expect something to change. So a few years ago, it dawned on me that if the politicians can't get this done by themselves, somebody's going to have to try to help them fix it. And as I'm from St. Louis, Missouri, I think I was especially susceptible to the wisdom behind a quote I once came across from one of our state's most famous native sons, Mark Twain. Citizenship, Twain said, is what makes a republic. Monarchies can get along without of it. Citizenship is what makes a republic. While I want to live in a republic, and I want my kids and grandkids to live in a republic, I also want to live in a country that's prosperous and forward-looking, like the one I grew up in. Our generation has a responsibility to the next, to leave our country in better shape than we received it. And ladies and gentlemen, we are failing miserably. We need a new paradigm, a paradigm in which citizens like me and you and millions of others who are concerned about our debt and other problems get involved to help the politicians break us out of the traps that we put ourselves in and that they've put us in and thereby help the country break out of the trap we all find ourselves in today. We need to educate the politicians and our citizens about why this debt problem is ultimately the biggest strategic risk to our nation and about the fact that economic growth can solve it. We need to help them with what I call the roadmap to prosperity, a roadmap that our elected officials can actually implement because it's based on growth, not, contr not contraction, and therefore politically feasible. This growth can be fueled by policies that allow millions of people to immigrate into our country and that favor those that we think will help our nation grow. Educated people, entrepreneurs, engineers, and the like. But also people who may not have these qualifications but want to work. Like my grandfather who came here from the Ukraine with nothing but a burning desire to breathe free and to make a good life for himself and his family. Also, this growth could be fueled by strategic investment that focuses on productivity improvement. Furthermore, we need to invest heavily in our human capital. We need much more aggressive and results-oriented workforce training and retraining, especially considering an economy that is changing at an exponential rate. I don't think we'll even recognize our country in 20 years, and it's imperative that we help the people that inevitably will be left behind. We also need a less expensive health care system. I believe we can accomplish this by having system-wide transparency on cost and quality, as a well allowing the patient to financially benefit by saving cost. How many of us even know what our health care costs, or what, are, what are one of those procedures costs? We don't know. We have to know. We have to, we have to be able to be involved in that decision. Finally, we need a sustainable Social Security system. Our, our current system is broken. This year alone, we'll spend $85 billion in debt, in debt, because we don't have the money to pay for Social Security. Time is of the essence. It can be fixed, but the longer we wait, the tougher the medicine will be. 
Now, I'm proud to say that all five of these initiatives have been combined into an integrated platform for growth and are being written by a group of experts led by the Concord Coalition. In fact, many of these, uh, in fact, many of the people involved in these studies are in the audience today, and this time I'd like to just recognize them. Alice Rivlin from the Brookings Institution, Lauren Adler from the Brookings Institution, Mark Goldwyn from Committee, Committee for Responsible Federal Budget, Ben Giddes from American Action Forum, Ron Atkinson from Information Technology and Innovation Foundation, Maya McGinnis from the Committee for Responsible Federal Budget, Douglas Holtz Eakin from the American Action Forum, Jacqueline Varas from American Action Forum, and Joe Antos from American Enterprise Institute, Bob Lerman from the Insti or Urban Institute, Pam Lopress from the Urban Institute, and Dan Kuhn from the Urban Institute. Not to add any pressure to them, but I, <laughs> but I personally can't wait for them to finish their work. So, the <laughs> so hurry up so that we can break this paradigm that's been trapping our politics and our country for way too long. Then we can live up to Mark Twain's imperative that we fulfill our responsibility as citizens to keep this country a republic and a successful one at that. That's the kind of country we all grew up in. And that's the kind of country I want to leave to our children and grandchildren. Thank you for this wonderful award. I will cherish it. But uh, aside from our honoree, Alice Rivlin has been the director of the Congressional Budget Office and the director of the Office of Management and Budget and on the vice chair of the Federal Reserve and a past winner of the Concord Coalition Economic Patriot Award. So what more could you want? Uh, Michael Peterson is uh, director and chairman and CEO of the Peter G. Peterson Foundation. Uh, he had a long, extensive experience as an entrepreneur an investor in the, uh, in the private sector. Before that, of course, the Peterson Foundation is very much involved in solving the challenges of the, the long-term fiscal ch and economic challenges of the nation. And Senator Jack Danforth, our co-chair, Senator from Missouri from 1976 to 1995, and before that was Attorney General of the state of Missouri. So as we, uh, you know, we've got, we've got some challenges here when the, uh, let me back up for a second here. Michael, I mentioned before that uh, uh, this is the first year that we've had this dinner without uh, your father, Pete Peterson, who was so fundamental to the founding of the Concord Coalition. And if I could start with you and just ask uh, if you could give us a few words about your father's legacy. Oh, well, thank you very much, Bob. It was, uh, it was a great pleasure to see that video. I, I actually was there that day on the street with, with them and remember it clearly. Uh, um, you know, my father had a great sense of humor, actually. He always loved to laugh and loved when people poked fun at him. And, and when Phil brought up running on empty, it reminded me of a great line that my dad loved about him. So he was good friends with Ted Sorensen, who was one of President Kennedy's speechwriters. And about his book, Running on Empty, Ted Sorensen said, with a title like Running on Empty, that must be an autobiography. <laughs> <laughs> and he also said, Running on Empty is a book that once you put it down, you won't be able to pick it up. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, my dad loved those jokes, and it was great to see him. And, and, and uh, I think if he were here tonight, I think he'd want to you know, say two things, probably. One is, one is thank you. Um, you know, he was a very successful businessman and investor, obviously, but really what gave him pleasure and fulfillment in life was his public service. And so whether that was his work in government, his work in various organizations that he helped get started, like the Concord Coalition, I think he found that most fulfilling and rewarding. And so he's very grateful to you, Bob, and to all the partners here of Concord over the years for the fulfillment and experience that he had starting this organization and leading it with you for so many years. Um, I think the second thing he would clearly say is keep going. Uh, he, this was his mission in life, was to address this long-term fiscal problem. He wrote six books on the subject and, and invested heavily through the foundation. Most of his legacy is, in this, is on this issue. And so uh, I think he'd want everyone here to keep it up and keep at it and uh, focus continually on the problem until it's solved. And uh, that's why I'm here running the foundation. Well, we appreciate the great work of the, uh, the Peterson Foundation. And your father did have a great sense of humor. And, and, and Michael, this is at 
at the mem great memorial service in New York, um, when Michael spoke, uh, he said that his father had left instructions that he was supposed to give a last uh, chart talk with many charts showing, uh, since he had a captive audience, the true dire fiscal problems of the nation. And uh, Michael then said, no, I'm just joking. And, uh, but I said to him afterwards, you know, I was waiting. I was hoping that you were going to actually do it, you know. I think you were the only one. I, 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 I'm the only one that drinks tab, too. So anyway, uh, today in, uh, in Washington is also a um, National Day of Mourning for President uh, George Herbert Walker Bush. And I thought uh, we should take a minute and, and ask uh, Alice and, and Jack if there were any remembrances of, of President Bush that they'd like to share. Alice. I'd like to share a very relevant one, uh, and I've been gratified in the torrent of uh, talk about uh, President Bush that uh, quite a number of people have pointed to his courage in the 1990 budget deal, which was two kinds of courage. One was, to the great distress of many of his Republican colleagues, he went back on his read my lips pledge and actually agreed in the context of this uh, monumental uh, agreement with the Democrats who controlled the, the, uh, the Hill uh, to raise taxes. He didn't get much credit for it. He got opprobrium from Republicans and very little credit from Democrats. But if you look back on the history, uh, that deal was extremely important, along with another one in 1993, in getting us uh, to the surpluses at the end of the 90s. But it wasn't just his courage in the uh, uh, tax increase. It was that that deal laid out some rules, uh, which in the Clinton administration we followed because it was the law, uh, and uh, that were very instrumental uh, in uh, getting to the surpluses at the end of the 90s. So uh, I think we owe a lot to uh, George H.W. Bush in the cause of uh, fiscal responsibility. Well, I, I vividly remember the uh, day that uh, 41 was inaugurated and being there on the steps of the Capitol during the inauguration and hearing him uh, call out by name Democratic leaders in the House with whom he had served. And um, I thought that that was very sort of characteristic of President Bush because he did believe in personal relationships and he did believe in trying to work things out. And in essence, what he was saying to the Democratic leadership was, look, I'm, I'm a Republican, I'm a president, and you're in charge of Congress, and let's work together and do things together. And that's, I think, the opposite of the current situation. And then another thing that he did, and about roughly a month after his inauguration, he invited all the members of the Senate to come to the White House and not just to be in the first floor, the formal floors of the of the White House, but to go up to the the living quarters on the second floor. And I can remember talking to Alan Cranston, who was the Democratic whip at the time. He said he'd never been up there, and he'd been decades in the U.S. Senate. And so that was the the idea of embracing people and bringing them into the into the action. Sally and I, my wife Sally and I, of course, I need I say this, plopped down on the bed in the <laughs> Lincoln bedroom where our picture was taken and we now have it framed on the wall by the president's brother and our good friend in St. Louis, Bucky Bush, took this picture of these two rubes from St. Louis <laughs> on the bed in the Lincoln bedroom. But I thought that that was so characteristic of 
George had George Bush 41, actually of a son too, of creating personal relationships and trying to work things out because if you work things out on a personal basis, you laid the foundation for getting serious things done. Well, I, I hate to go from words of inspiration about Pete Peterson and George Herbert Walker Bush to the realities of the budget situation. Um, I want to, I, I do really want to focus on positive things this evening because we're often gloom and doom and we often talk about, you know, the, the, the hard choices and that sort of thing. That sort of distinguishes the Concord Coalition. But I do think that we can, add, we should be p trying to paint a, a brighter uh, future and how we get there. But before we get positive, <laughs> Let's just set the, the stage here when, when to, to reiterate that there is a serious problem here. When Congress comes back, they're going to go to work on the fiscal year, not when they come back this year, but when the new Congress takes, takes office. They're going to uh, go to work on the fiscal year 2020 budget. And the projected deficit is a trillion dollars. That's just astounding. I mean, the, that debt clock at New York City was $4 trillion. That was the whole debt. <laughs> We're talking about a trillion-dollar deficit being projected for the next fiscal year in a strong economy without a major war. Um, let me just pose the question, does that prove that deficits don't matter or have people simply chosen to ignore them? <laughs> or both. <laughs> well, I think it uh, proves that uh, people have chosen to ignore them, but you have to give them a little bit of credit. Uh, many of us have been talking about this problem for several decades, and no disaster has ensued that can be uh, obviously attributed uh, to uh, the size of the deficit. Uh, that doesn't mean it won't, but this, we have not gotten across what the problem is. And in part, I think, because uh, we've said the sky is falling, the sky is falling, and it hasn't actually fallen yet. Uh, much of the world is very willing uh, to lend to the United States of America uh, at quite low interest rates. Uh, because they think we're a very responsible country and we will pay our debts, and besides, we're the best game in town. Uh, and uh, we have not explained how these several things fit together. In the land of the one eye, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. So here we have all these other countries supporting or partially supporting our deficit. And I think at some point it comes to an end. There's a tipping point at some point. We're not there yet. And we have been talking about this for decades. But when that point comes, I believe that point comes at some point. And when it does, it's not going to be pretty. You know, one of the things that, speaking of things coming to an end, we're, we're benefiting now from... Uh, a strong economy, a very long recovery. It might not be always robust, but we've, we're almost at a record recovery. It's been over nine years. We're kind of due for a recession. Uh, so among the things that we should worry about, should, should policymakers now be thinking about a plan for what might happen when a recession hits, where you could deal with that and try to simultaneously deal with the long-term problem. Is that? Well, I think we kind of have to change the narrative here. I, I, I appreciate what you're saying, which is the sky hasn't fallen yet. Um, but I don't think we should have been arguing, and I don't think we should continue to argue that the sky will fall. I think our goal is not to borrow just enough so that you know, a dollar less than it would be in a crisis. I think the question is more, does this make sense? And when I look particularly at interest costs, so over the next few years, I think three years from now, we'll spend more on interest than we do on our kids. 
about five years now, from now, we'll spend more on interest than we do on national defense. About 10 years from now, it'll be the third largest program in the government. And so, okay, yes, we can borrow money right now. Yes, there's more room. We're not quite like Greece. Like, it doesn't mean the United States is gonna crumble tomorrow, but does this make any sense to anybody? And I think, to what you said earlier about economic growth, I mean, the Republicans worked very hard to, to put in place a trillion and a half dollar tax cut to stimulate the economy. Democrats want to do a trillion dollar infrastructure plan to stimulate the economy. The interest costs over the next 10 years are seven trillion. So if we didn't have any debt, can you imagine what we could do with those funds that would actually be investments in our future as opposed to investments in our past? So rather than say the United States is gonna crumble in the next few years if we don't deal with this, I think we should talk about a rational economic policy for growth and inclusion and, and prosperity rather than the sky is falling. One of the one of the uh, one of the issues that would have to be dealt with in any sort of agenda that uh, we've talked about a little bit um, is is healthcare costs. I think uh, universally, the rising cost of healthcare is considered not just for federal programs but system wide uh, the, the biggest single programmatic challenge of the federal budget. Um, so let's offer some ideas, some positive visions, if we could, for how we might get control of that, you know, beyond just simply, well, we have to cut something or raise people's premiums. I mean, how, are there some strategies that are being worked on or that you think have promise, and I know Jeff had, had mentioned his, his vision, uh, that would help to control healthcare costs and hence contribute to economic growth and improve the budget outlook? I, I think that when you think about the entitlements, health care um, is easier to deal with. Nothing's easy to deal, easy to deal with, but it's politically more possible to deal with health care than it is with Social Security. Because essentially in Social Security, you're saying, okay, we're going to limit the amount of dollars that the government is going to give you. That's tougher to, to argue than to say, okay, something is broken in the healthcare system and we've got to fix that systemically. And so I, I think that that's, that's very promising and particularly to try to move away from the current system, which is fee-for-service medicine, where um, providers are paid by the test, by the procedure that they're doing as opposed to what are the results in healthcare. So I think to move from fee for service to paying for performance is the way to go. I'll just give you sort of one personal example. So I went for a couple of years before I got wise to it, to a dermatologist and I began to think I am the annuity of my dermatologist <laughs> because the dermatologist every time I would go in would blast me about 10 times with liquid nitrogen and charge per blast. I didn't have to pay it. That was good. Medicare paid for it. But I thought, you know, now I go to a dermatologist who doesn't do anything to me, and I like that. I think that that's a better deal. But I think that if you were to, if we were to say to the healthcare providers, the doctors and the hospitals, we are going to pay you to keep people well, as opposed to just paying for the specific process that you're putting in place, that would be a very useful way to control the cost of health. The other thing is, I, I think we have the responsibility in the wrong place. The responsibility right now is on the government to pay, to pay for it. And we've lost the idea of the consumer. So I don't know any other market, you know, I'm in business, I don't know any other market that works that way besides other things that the government is doing. But it seems to me that you have to have transparency to say how good is the, what is the quality, what is the cost of this, and put skin in the game for the consumer. And if you do that, allow them, allow them 
to control their destiny, to have the responsibility and have part of the savings, you'll have entrepreneurs like me and a lot of other people in this room doing things that drive costs out of the healthcare system. It's, it's not that hard to fix. We just gotta, I think, turn it back the other way. Let the free market work. Yeah, I, I would add to that. I think, I think uh, as Senator Danforth said, we have incentives that are totally upside down, right? The more they do to you, the, the more money they make as opposed to the hell that you are. And, and as Jeff said, transparency and information is an essential ingredient in any market. Right? Anyone who studies economics, information is critical in terms of quality and price. And so we have this private health care system that we call it, uh, but it violates all the core rules of any economic equation. And so those two things are absolutely essential. But again, I think we also need to change the conversation a little bit. I mean, the entire national health care debate has been about the ACA, for example, for many years. And that was used as a political weapon you know, for, for several years. Uh, we find ourselves talking about pre-existing conditions ad nauseum. I mean, these aren't unimportant issues. They are important, but they are missing the overall problem, which is we spend 18, 19, heading to 20 to 25 percent of our GDP on healthcare costs when many other nations have better outcomes and spend half as much. And that's a wage issue, so we're all concerned about slow wage growth. One of the reasons we have slow wage growth in this country is that the benefit package just keeps going up. I mean, you know as a businessman as I do, you do your annual budget and you see healthcare costs go up 11%, 12%, 9%, and that squeezes wages, it just does. So it's a wage issue, it's a competitiveness issue. Anybody creating jobs here has to deal with that as part of their cost structure. I think it's a huge education issue because it's crowding out spending at the state and local level because the healthcare obligations are rising so quickly. And a really scary, scary statistic, we, do, we did a big project with the Institute of Medicine that outlined the level of waste in the system. The waste alone in healthcare is more than we spend on K through 12 education in this country. So if you care about education, you need to care about healthcare too. So and, and by waste, you mean services that aren't needed? Unnecessary. Uh, sort of things that Jack Danforth yeah, was yeah, describing. It's over, uh, price, uh, you know, high prices that are too high, unnecessary procedures. Uh, and injurious. Yeah, injure it, people getting infected at higher rates. I mean, when they infect you, they make more money. I mean, I'm not saying that they're doing it deliberately, but that's kind of upside down, right? I mean, it but sometimes be maybe they do. I hope not. But I uh, always wonder what my dentist is doing in there. Is he drilling holes or you know? I mean, but I don't. I don't think we should leave the impression that this is somehow easy to fix. It's not, or it would have been fixed. Uh, and uh, Senator Danforth says very rightly, we should pay for performance. But you can only pay for performance if you can measure performance. And we're not very good at that at the moment. Uh, and the hard work of designing uh, a different set of incentives hasn't really been done yet. Now, Michael says the Pe Peterson position, uh, uh, Foundation is, uh, is working on this. Lots of people are working on this. But it's not a slam dunk. It's not easy. Well, I, I mean, sometimes there are experiments that Medicare will run that work and that Congress rejects because they worked. Because somebody's constituent Absolutely. got, yeah, got. Uh, I mean, uh, what we describe as waste is somebody's income. It's, it's, it, it, that's part of, the, uh, part of the conundrum of dealing with that. Um, just and one I, more, just yeah. one more point on healthcare. We were talking today about this, and as you think about this, here we are, a country probably the largest uh, user of prescription drugs, yet we don't have a most favored nations clause where the government purchases the drug. Most favored nations clause means if you, if an, anyone else buys that cheaper, you get that price. So we have Canada buying cheaper, and all these other bu countries buying cheaper, yet. We're the one buying the most drugs. Why aren't, why aren't we getting the benefit of the deal? Actually, the uh, current secretary of uh, HHS uh, has a proposal. Uh, it's a very limited proposal, and it only applies to uh, Medicare Part B drugs. Uh, but it is sort of what you're talking about. Uh, it is that the pharmaceutical companies should um, price drugs <laughs> to the U.S. at 
126% of something, of some average of what they're uh, getting in the other. Uh, See, there they go complicating it again. Just say, uh, all you got to say is, hey, look, X country bought it for this, so you got to match the price. Yeah, uh, they're, they're <laughs> but that, the, the essence of this proposal is, is exactly that. Um, Alice, you had the experience uh, working both on the Rivlin Dominici Task Force, and uh, I believe you tried to work uh, with with Paul Ryan on some way to make um, premium support work. The concept of premium support to to have competition among providers for for Medicare, and it it always struck me that that is. It, it just, it, that was a, a really good idea, and it became highly politicized. Um, could, could you reflect that's a little bit? <laughs> well, that's one of our problems, that uh, we politicize everything. Um, yes, uh, the idea of premium support uh, is uh, that uh, uh, for Medicare, uh, the government would pay uh, not on a fee-for-service basis, uh, but uh, uh, on um, would pay a, a uh, an HMO basically uh, to um, uh, provide Medicare services, and uh, then uh, it, the uh, amount that the government would pay would be preset, and uh, you could, if you were on Medicare. Uh, get your Medicare at that price, or if you wanted something fancier and better, uh, you could pay more for it. Um, and the uh, guaranteed amount that the government would pay would not go up faster than some index. Um, so that would make it predictable. And I think that makes quite a lot of sense, and it's been proposed again and again. Um, it <coughs> has to be proposed in a form that the uh, current Medicare beneficiaries don't feel they're going to lose a lot. They're going, and and that's perfectly possible. And phasing in changes is one of the. I mean, that that makes a lot of the stuff can be phased in, and yet the political dialogue, as you just said, is is kind of like looking at something that might happen 30 years and saying it's going to happen tomorrow. Well, yes, and that's true of Social Security too. Uh, Senator Danforth was talking about uh, this. Uh, uh, the terrible uh, faces on the audience uh, think they're going to uh, get their Social Security benefits cut. Actually, no proposal to fix Social Security would hurt anybody who is currently on Social Security. And if one makes that clear, uh, and makes clear that uh, the changes are going to happen quite far in the future, uh, there is much less kickback. We did that in 1983. We raised the uh, retirement age, and it's still going on. It's being raised slowly over time, uh, and nobody notices. Yeah, but the problem is, is more than just the, the reality. The problem is the, the political statement that's going to be made in the 30-second commercial. Oh, absolutely. Senator Rivlin voted to cut your Social Security. Yeah. And because I'm elderly, I get all these little announces, uh, uh, appeals, send money so that those terrible people won't cut your Social Security. And vote for me. And vote for me, yeah. yes. <laughs> it's, it's, it's interesting how many emails I get uh, from politicians who have a uh, moderate reputation of bipartisan working across the aisle. You get their fundraising emails like, Social Security is going to be killed next week if you don't send me $15. <laughs> this is like, oh my goodness. Um, okay, so moving on from healthcare, there's another subject that is kind of an interesting one that the Concord is exploring in these papers. You know, one of the, one of the reasons that economic growth is projected to be slower much slower in recent years than the trend of the past 30 years or so, is that the labor force growth has, uh, has slowed so dramatically with the aging of the population. And you look at some of the charts, and it's just, it's really dramatic that 
pop, you know, the potential workforce used to grow at, uh, somewhere around one and a half percent a year, and now it's around half percent a year projected. That makes a big difference for the economic projections of the future, and that's a lot of, that exacerbates uh, some of these, you know, fiscal problems that we've been talking about. And, you know, nobody's saying you can really grow your way out without doing something on the fiscal side. But, you know, Jeff and I have been talking a lot, and we've got a, one of our papers is dealing specifically with immigration policy about, you know, can the United States help enhance growth by replacing, in effect, some of the population that we're losing? I, I, is that a strategy for growth? How was that for a softball question, yeah, <laughs> Jeff? Right absolutely, absolutely. I think this is uh, But, um, you know, I think our, our death rate in this country is higher than our birth rate and yet we have an aging population. And so when you think about Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid and all that, who's gonna pay for it? So I think our concept is, yeah, we, gotta, we have to grow this population, and the best, I think the best, easiest way to do that is through immigration. And not only just any immigration, but it's immigration on people that are gonna make a difference to our country and grow. And if we do that and we bring a lot more of them in, we can change. Right now we're upside down. We, we're, we have an aging population and we have a youth, our children that are gonna have to pay for us. And there's not as many of them as there are as old people. So we're gonna have to do something to change that. We can say, hey, pay to have more babies, but that's gonna take a long time. So I think what we ought to do is immigrate, immigrate a bunch of people that are the right people. And then another, on the economic um, side of it, I certainly agree, but we have to do that in a way that doesn't scare people. The people who come in look different from the average American, and uh, we have a panic situation on our on our hands. And to me, that's education. You know, it's it's how do we educate our citizenry on why this is so good? It's a lot like what you're saying about healthcare. It's we have to educate people, this is the problem, and here are the solutions, and there's just not that many. And so, yeah, they're gonna look different than us, and is that bad? That's probably good. It, it makes us more interesting as a, as, as a population. I think it's, uh, you know, a a a adding increased immigration to Social Security reform and Medicare reform is, is a very appropriate thing for the Concord Coalition to do. It's, it really is the political agenda from hell, you know. Um, <laughs> but it all is <laughs> aimed towards economic growth. And uh, so anyway, I, I, I kind of like this interest. Now, one of the things that I have to say, re referring to, 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 to Pete Peterson, is that he had a hard and fast rule that Concord Coalition dinners, or any dinner that he had anything to do with, was going to end at 9.30, no later than 9.30. He, he told this story that when he moved to New York, people asked him to, to go to dinners, and, and he would go, and people eventually asked him to chair a dinner, and he said, I'll chair a dinner for your organization if you will promise me that it's over by 9.30. And they said, oh, no, 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 Pete, you don't understand. Our, our, our People that come to our dinners like to hear speeches long into the night and have, well, oh, oh. and Pete said, no, 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 I've been at these dinners as a guest and I can tell you you're, you're kidding yourself. So, so Pete got, so they said, okay, all right, well, because Pete was a very good dinner chair and I can tell you that because he used to chair our dinner. And, uh, and he said that the first time he did that, he made an announcement at the beginning. He said, I'm going to tell you something right now, and that is that this dinner will be over at 9.30, at which point Pete said he got the only standing ovation he'd ever had in his life. So, so we make that promise that we are over at 9.30, so we're gonna have like one last question here with very brief answers so we can stick with the, uh, the Peterson rule. Uh, I don't, <laughs> I don't, uh, I, 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 I wasn't planning to, to quote Pete again, but what, we're, we're, we're looking at Pete Peterson's books. He wrote another one, which I love the title of, called, this was in 1994, somewhere around there. Will America Grow Up Before It Grows Old? 22 or so years later, do we know the answer to that question? 
Where are we on we that? We haven't grown up yet. I think we can say <laughs> that. I <laughs> don't know if we know the technical answer that will we, will we eventually grow up. I, I think we will grow up before we grow old. I think uh, this is... There's a lot of problems around the world. The, the thing I like about this challenge is that it's fixable. We know exactly how to do it, and we're in total control of our budget. We don't need other countries to cooperate. We don't need to convince other people around the world, and uh, I think we can do it. It's just a matter of the political will. We just need to convince ourselves right. collectively. Well, I don't know what the answer to that question is either, but I know that we're going to damn sure keep trying to uh, grow up and <laughs> encourage others. There's nothing we can do about growing old, let me put it that way. I can tell you that from personal experience. And, uh, <laughs> But, uh, but there's nothing we can do about that. But there's nothing inevitable about a crisis. And, and really, uh, I, as I said at the beginning, it's very gratifying to see people who are still interested in this issue and who look at it as a future-oriented issue. That was, that was what Pete Peterson, Paul Songus, and Warren Rudman always talked about. It's not the size of the budget deficit today or the debt today. It is a future-oriented thing. It's how are you going to have a sustainable fiscal future that's going to lead to the sort of economic growth that you need to preserve the American dream for future generations. That's what our volunteers are worried about. That's what our uh, policy people are worried about. That's what I'm worried about. And that's what our panelists are worried about. So thank you all for coming. And by golly, I think we're going to do it this time. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you.